He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you all this morning as we celebrate together the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Uh, I do want to uh, begin with a couple of announcements before we have our first uh, song and also our call to worship. First of all, after the service this morning, I invite you to stay before you head off to whatever activities or lunches you may have for what we call Grace Cafe, just an opportunity for us to celebrate together for a few minutes in fellowship with one another. So it's going to be right through those double doors in our fellowship hall. And then also, just a reminder for everyone, because they're coming up in just a couple of weeks, our men's overnight uh, is April 12th and 13th. The brochures are available to sign up. So please, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me, you can ask uh, Doug Parry, um, and get those brochures in. Uh, also, the women's conference is the following weekend, the Saturday, April 20th. It's a one-day event here at the church, and those brochures are also available at the Welcome Center. Uh, one more announcement uh, on the flowers on stage here this morning. The lilies are available to be taken home after the uh, conclusion of this morning's service. So if you would like an Easter lily, feel free to, uh, to take one. All right, please stand with me for our call to worship this morning as we read about the resurrection. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 9, says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And let's worship our Lord together.
seated. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 57. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 57. What I'm sorry, what I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. When our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Great good Father in heaven, we come before you this glorious morning confessing our need for your forgiveness. Forgive our many faults, actions, thoughts, and deeds that violate your law. We ask that you renew our minds, our hearts, and lives for the days ahead. Keep your words of truth planted firm within us. Help us to focus on what is pure and right. Fill us with the power to be obedient to your word. And when the enemy reminds us of where we have been, hissing his lies and attacks our way, we know that your voice will speak louder and stronger reminding us we are safe with you and that your purposes and plans will not fail. We also come before you this morning celebrating, knowing that the grave is empty and that he is risen, making all things new. Thank you, Jesus, for paving the way for us to have new life with you. Thank you for that victory. Now, Holy Spirit, enlighten us. Make our minds and hearts open to your coming sermon. Let it impact our thinking, our emotions, our souls, to make us beacons of light in darkness as we go into the world showing others your love. Let us always remember, Jesus' death is our life. His resurrection is our peace. His ascension is our hope. May none of us find hope or peace until we find peace and hope in your risen Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand?
In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. alone 
Amen. You may be seated. Amen. All right, all right, all right. Uh, grades one, two, and three are dismissed for uh, junior church. And um, <laughs> today we are celebrating the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I love, uh, I love that scene that started the, uh, the service with that passage where the women come to the tomb and, uh, and the stone is rolled away and the angel is speaking with them. Because, you know, when you read the Bible sometimes, it's often hard to know with what tone someone is speaking when they're speaking. And so, like, in Matthew 28, 6, the angel says, He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Now, I think usually we read that with uh, excitement and enthusiasm, but I wonder if the angel didn't have somewhat of a different tone, almost like he's not here, for he has risen, obviously. And the reason I say that is because in Luke 24, the same scene, we get a few more details there, and the angel says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he had told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Doesn't that sound kind of like, what did you expect? You know, whenever you say to somebody, remember how you were told, you know, I told you. Uh, here... You know, why are you surprised? Of course he's not here. Of course he's alive. That's what he told you was going to happen. Remember? And, and what they're referencing, the angels are referencing, is how on several occasions on the way to Jerusalem during Jesus' ministry, at least three times that is recorded for us, Jesus explained to his followers, here's exactly how this is all going to play out. We're going to go to Jerusalem I'm going to suffer many things from the Jewish religious leaders. I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. They're going to kill me. And on the third day, I'll rise again. So again and again, Jesus has said this while he was still alive with his followers. Here's what's going to happen. And so just as he said, they get to Jerusalem and it all happens. He's arrested by the Jews. He suffers many things. They hand him over to, to the Romans. They put him to death. And so it's one thing after the other, just as Jesus said. And then what did Jesus conclude each of those paragraphs with? Well, on the third day, I'll rise again. And so here is the angel speaking to the women following his resurrection and saying to them, hey, this is just what he said. Of course he's not here. Of course he's risen. Why are you looking for a dead Jesus? And they respond with, you know, Matthew says, fear and joy uh, Mark tells us they were trembling and astonished. Luke tells us they were perplexed and frightened. So it seems to be kind of a mix of emotions. There's confusion and fear, but also some excitement and joy as they think, could it really be so? And of course, when Jesus appears to them in the days ahead, then it's all confirmed. Then they get it. Then they realize he's really alive. And, you know, I often want to cut the disciples some slack because it's easy to beat up on them. You know, we beat up on the disciples a lot for their lack of faith. Uh, you know, to read what happens and what Jesus said and you think, come on, guys. Like, he told you three times this was going to happen. Why are y'all so scared and uncertain and, and confused and living as though maybe Jesus was not telling the truth. But shouldn't we know better also? Because the, the fact is this same Bible tells us that not only did Jesus rise from the dead, that that's what was coming for him when he 
went to Jerusalem and suffered those things and died, that not only was Jesus going to rise from the dead, but that there is more than just this life for every one of us. Every one of us is an eternal soul. And the Bible tells us there is a way to be sure that that resurrection, that when that day comes for us, that it will be good and hope-filled and joyous. The question is, do we believe it? Do you believe it? I think in some sense, we all want to believe in resurrection, in, in some life beyond just this life. And, and we all want it to be good. And nobody wants to suffer. Uh, did you know that uh, three quarters of Americans, 75% believe that this life is not all there is? 75% believe that there's something to come, though they don't, of course, agree on what that is or how to get to heaven or anything like that. But even over 30% of atheists believe in life after death. So that uh, even while numbers of people today claim to be uh, religious in some way or believe in some way, God in some way, even though that number is declining with you know, each passing year, the number of people who believe in life after death is either steady or rising. That's kind of fascinating, isn't it? In fact, uh, one atheist, a, a writer named Martin Hughes, even said, quote, I wish there was heaven. Now, as I said, it doesn't mean everyone has the same view of what life after this life will be like. But on the specific issue of bodily resurrection, that we will rise again, overall 37% of Americans believe that there will be a bodily resurrection of the dead. Now, as I said, the Bible tells us that Jesus is not the only one who will experience resurrection. We read in several places in the Bible of uh, the coming resurrection of all both believers and unbelievers. Let me give you two examples here. Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaking while on trial in Acts chapter 24, he says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Uh, in John chapter 5, Jesus speaking. He says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So we, we see here and in other scriptures that this life is not all there is. That there will come a day when, like Jesus, we all will rise we all are eternal souls. However, what these passages also make clear is there's a difference between believers and unbelievers, as Paul calls them, just and unjust. For the unbeliever, those still in their sin, separated from God, they will rise again to face eternal judgment for their sin. The Bible is very clear that the wages of sin is death, not death as a cessation of existence, like an annihilation, but death as an eternal separation from God, which Jesus describes in several places as weeping and gnashing of teeth. For the believer, those who are right with God, of course, not because anything in and of themselves, not because of any good in them or any good that they've done, but because they're made right by the grace of God through faith in the finished work of Jesus, they will rise to a glorious and wonderful future. In fact, most of the times the Bible talks about resurrection, the coming resurrection, the focus is on the believer and how the resurrection of Jesus gives us assurance that we too will rise again and that in rising we will be like him. We will see him and we will forevermore be with him. It will be glorious indeed. Uh, let me give you some of these encouraging verses. Resurrection hope for the believer. Precious, precious promises here for life beyond this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. And I love this passage. One of my favorites in the Bible. I just think this is 
such a comforting passage to those who are suffering or to those who are near death or have loved ones near death or those who are suffering from various physical issues. Paul writes, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So Paul tells us these bodies that we are currently living in are temporary, temporary dwellings, he calls them. They're not designed to last forever. They break down. They are breaking down, some more quickly than others, some further along in the breakdown ridge than others. But for those who know Christ, who will rise to everlasting life, we have an eternal heavenly dwelling, a heavenly body that will live forever with no more pain, no more breaking down. Now, I don't, I don't know exactly what that will be like. You know, this is one of those areas where I think we have a lot more questions than the Bible gives us uh, answers for. We want, we want all the details of uh, what that experience will be like. But we can't say anything for sure beyond what the Bible tells us. And I think what God wants us to know and understand, which is that clearly we will live and our new bodies will no longer see decay or breaking down or experience suffering in any way. Uh, then how about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Again, Paul writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, normally we think of this passage as a return of Jesus passage, a second coming of Jesus passage. But really, Paul is encouraging them about future resurrection. With future resurrection, he says, I do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and I hope you believe that, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So Paul tells us the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus is coming again. Some, he says, will still be alive when that day comes. So, you know, it's not actually true to say that death is a certainty for every one of us. We often say that. I've said that many times. But built into that is the caveat that it is only true if Jesus does not return during our lifetime. But at some point, at some point, he will return and there will be believers alive on the earth who will go to be with him without experiencing death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we would, uh, Ron read earlier, and I'm going to read part of it again. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. We will not all sleep. But many who are believers, right, most you might say, believers in Jesus will have passed before that time. Again, we don't know when Jesus is coming just that he is. Some that we love have already passed. Uh, maybe we will be alive when he comes, maybe not, the Lord knows. But the precious promise here is that whether alive or dead, all of those who belong to Christ, Paul writes, will meet him in the air and so forever be with the Lord. Those in the grave, he says, will rise and those living will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord Jesus. 
and to forever be with him. And Paul concludes by saying these words of comfort. Comfort one another, he says. Encourage one another with these words. And one more passage here. This is the uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul again, he writes, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality." The, the resurrection of Jesus, a fact. He's alive. And because he is alive, we know that we too will rise again. And, and the scriptures tell us again and again and again. Those who belong to Christ, as he says here, who believe that Jesus died and rose again, as he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, will rise to everlasting life with Jesus. Given this eternal, imperishable, new, changed heavenly glorified body. Again, what exactly that will be like, we can't say more than the scriptures, but the scriptures are clear. It will be glorious. It will be wonderful. As Paul says in Philippians 1, it's something to look forward to. You know, he says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Paul knows that this life is not the end. When this life ends, physically here on earth, we have a building from God, eternal in the heavens with Jesus. And he says, I long to go and be with Christ, for that is far better. How wonderful to know that what is yet to come is far better than what we have experienced here. If you know Christ, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again and you're trusting only in him and his saving work on the cross for your sin, do you Believe this. Do you believe it? I want to take our, our, our next few minutes here and, and tell you a story. It comes from the Gospel of John. So I, t I invite you to take your Bible and open to John chapter 11. Gospel of John chapter 11. If you need a Bible, it should be one available uh, under one of the chairs in front of you. And this story here, it has to do with death, physical death. And it has to do with resurrection. And in the midst of it, Jesus makes a wonderful statement that I wish everyone would take time to meditate on, think on, ponder about. Think about this for yourself, how you would respond. Uh, it starts here in verse 1, John chapter 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. All right, Jesus had few friends while he lived on the earth, uh, but among them were certainly his disciples and also this family from the city of Bethany. Two sisters and a brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Throughout the Gospels, we read of various accounts where Jesus spent time in their house, and the text makes it very clear to us he loved this family. And upon hearing that one of his friends, Lazarus, was ill, he makes this trip towards his house. Jesus knew, however, that Lazarus was going to die. In fact, we even see here that upon hearing that he is ill, Jesus doesn't immediately run to Lazarus' house. But rather, he stays where he is for two more days. Why does he do that? Look down at verse 11. He says, after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. 
Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Now the disciples did not seem to understand. Uh, Jesus at first used the common term of the day, Lazarus is sleeping. The disciples thought, well, that's all right. <laughs> and wake up. So Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And notice what he says. Don't miss it. All that he's doing and saying here. He says, verse 15, this is happening so that you may believe. He's very intentional. Every decision that he makes, so that you may believe. Uh, note he's talking to his disciples there. But that need here, this passage here is written down for us. For our, us to consider and think about. Right? We have a need for belief as well. What Jesus is going to do throughout this passage here is use death in two ways. In the Bible, death has to do with separation. Uh, when we speak of death, we speak of the immaterial, the soul, being separated from the material, the body. Lazarus had indeed died in this way. And that's what Jesus is saying. Lazarus is dead. So he means physically dead. But the Bible also speaks of death in a spiritual sense. Death, eternal death, is the separation of the soul for all eternity from the presence of God. From the beginning of time, God did not design us or create us to be separated from him. But death has come into the world as a result of sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this is a problem that affects us all. We all have sinned and we're all headed in the direction of physical death. And as a result of our sin... We are also spiritually dead, separated from God. Jesus makes this clear to his disciples. Lazarus is dead. However, he arrives in town. Uh, he makes it clear there is good news. There is eternal life. Skip down, verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Right, as Jesus approaches the town, Martha comes running out to him, the sister of Lazarus. She knew that Jesus, who had healed many diseases, could have healed Lazarus. And she cries out, if only you had been here. But Jesus doesn't only have the power to heal disease. He also has the power to raise the dead. And he says to Martha plainly, your brother will live. And Martha thinks Jesus is only talking about future spiritual life. And she says, I know at the end of time... He'll rise in the resurrection. Now we know from what happens next that Jesus is here speaking both of spiritual life and physical life. But his focus is on the spiritual. He tells her, Martha, I offer eternal life. And it is simply a matter of faith. If anyone believes in me, Jesus says, though they may die physically, they live eternally. And what Jesus is speaking about in saying, I am the resurrection and the life, is having a relationship with him. Knowing him and walking with him now. Not just future rising from the dead like Martha thinks about, but an eternal relationship with God that begins now and continues on into eternity. So that there's no death spiritually now. It's removed and there never will be for those who believe in Jesus. Now, how can this be? Well, a few minutes ago, and I, I read Romans 6, 23, which says the wages of sin is death. We all have sinned and are separated from God because of our sin. But the second half of that verse says, but the free gift of God 
is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, how's the rest of the story goes? Well, Jesus goes, he finds Lazarus dead, and he simply calls out a command, Lazarus, come out. And it says the man who had died came out. Lazarus was alive, physically, again. And what Jesus shows is he has the power over life and death. And yet it wasn't long after this that Jesus himself would go to the cross and die. But the Bible tells us he didn't die because he was a sinner like you and I. He was perfect. Yet the Bible tells us that he went to the cross and took our sins upon himself. That's why we read in John 3, 16, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. And Jesus here asks Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe this? In verse 26, Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. What do you say? What do you say? We must believe we are sinners. We have broken God's law. We must believe that the good news that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died in our place, taking our sin upon himself. And the Bible says, if we believe this, though we may die physically, we will live eternally. You know, a physical death eventually came again for Lazarus. Even though here Jesus raises him up, later he, like all of us, would die physically as Paul says, our, our, our bodies are breaking down. They're temporary dwellings. But as a believer in Jesus, he was always alive spiritually. We read in Hebrews chapter 9, 27 and 28, Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. You might say, well, in Lazarus' case, he's a little bit of an exception here. But we are all headed for physical death. That's what's coming. Came again for Lazarus. It's going to come for each one of us. It says, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus came to give life, eternal life, because every one of us is an eternal soul. Every, that resurrection day is going to come where each soul is going to stand before him the just and the unjust the believer and the unbeliever some into eternal life some into eternal death the question that he asked Martha is the question we all must answer Jesus said I am the resurrection and the life whoever believes in me though he die Yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Because you know, we experience in our lives, every one of us, the reality of all of these passages. We know exactly what Paul is talking about when he, he describes that breaking down. Because we feel it ourselves. As we get older, you feel it in your body. Or you know of loved ones who they broke down to that point of death. We know that we're not going to be able to have a fountain of youth. They're not going to figure out a way to overcome this. The average life is, what, 70, 80 years. Some make 90, some make 100. It's coming for everyone, though. But so is resurrection. And for the believer in Jesus, the one who rose from the dead, what is coming is this glorious, eternal, perfect eternity beyond anything that we can even imagine or comprehend. That's why I think the Bible doesn't give us too many details because you can't describe what that will be like. It's going to be glorious because it's going to be in the presence of Jesus forevermore. And Jesus says, you'll never die. You'll never be separated from me if you believe this. Do you believe this? Jesus rose from the dead. 
And the day is coming when we all will be resurrected, some to eternal life, some to eternal death. Do you believe this? Turn from your sin and trust in him today. Let's pray together. Father, as we celebrate today the reality of the resurrection, as our minds and our hearts are drawn once again to the open, empty tomb, we recognize that what Jesus did, he, he did once for all. His death satisfied the demands, Lord, that pays for our sin. And God, I pray that each one here would know you through faith in Christ. God would know that whenever that day comes for them, and it will come for every one of us, Lord, that they will rise again and be forevermore with you. We'll have life eternal. Lord, we don't have to guess. We don't have to just hope. God, we can know that we can pass from this life into your eternal presence through faith in Christ. Oh God, I pray that each one would know this, would believe this, would surrender their life to you. Thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Would you please stand?
Just a, a couple of uh, reminders as we depart. Uh, one, uh, Ron is going to be available. If anyone would like prayer or uh, any information more about what we talked about this morning, uh, Brother Ron Hack is going to be available at the front of the stage here. I'll also be back in the, in the back of the uh, auditorium as well as Pastor Bob. And uh, everyone is invited to stay for a wonderful time of rejoicing together at what we call Grace Cafe in our fellowship hall. So I hope that you can stick around for a few minutes and uh, join us there. And also don't forget the uh, Easter lilies uh, are available to be taken home today. All right. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.